Let me ask you to open your Bibles to Exodus, the second book in the Old Testament, Exodus chapter 7. We're thinking of the plagues of Egypt. That's not very user-friendly, is it? What's the pastor preaching on tonight? He's preaching on the plagues of Israel. But in all seriousness, as we study the Word of God, and if we do it in a serious, systematic way, we cover all of the subjects. Uh, Paul said to the Ephesian elders that he declared the whole counsel of God. And the only way I know, I think anyone knows, to declare the whole counsel of God is to teach the whole Word of God. So the series is on the life of Moses, and it would be impossible to think of Moses without thinking of the plagues of Egypt. We're going to read about one of them, and then we're going to cover the first nine this evening, Lord willing. Exodus chapter 7, and uh, we're reading from verse 14. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the, in the morning as he's going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him, and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you shall say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you have not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile, and it shall turn into blood. The fish in the Nile shall die, and the Nile shall stink, and the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking water from the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, Say to Aaron, Take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the rivers, their canals, their ponds, and all their pools of water, so that they may become blood and there shall be blood throughout all of the land of Egypt, even in vessels of wood and in vessels of stone. Verse 20, Moses and Aaron did as the Lord commanded. In the sight of Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants, he lifted up the staff and struck the water in the Nile, and all the water in the Nile turned into blood. And the fish in the Nile died, and the Nile stank, so that the Egyptians could not drink water from the Nile. There was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. But the magicians of Egypt did the same and by their secret arts. So Pharaoh's heart remained hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. And all the Egyptians dug along the Nile for water to drink, for they could not drink the water of the Nile. Seven full days passed after the Lord had struck the Nile, the first of the ten plagues. <clears throat> now, for those of you who not been in this series, let me just remind you a little very quickly of the context. Moses is being called by God to deliver the people of Israel from their slavery in Egypt and to lead them to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, even though uh, we know Moses himself is not going to enter into the land. Moses uh, comes from a godly family, from the tribe of Levi. And as a child, he'd been adopted by the daughter of Pharaoh. And so, he was raised in the Egyptian palace, enjoying the treasures and the pleasures of Egypt. But when he was 40 years old, he goes to his own people. He identifies with them. Uh, they are slaves in Egypt. He defends an Israelite, kills an Egyptian. And when this becomes known, he becomes a fugitive. And he has to leave Egypt and goes to the land of Midian, where he worked as a shepherd for 40 years. That's a long time, isn't it? He marries, he has a family, and I'm sure in that time in the desert, Moses learned a lot about himself, certainly a lot about sheep, but a lot about God. And his faith, I'm sure, was being firmed and established during that time. One day when he's looking after the sheep, near Mount Horeb, the Mount of God as it's described, he saw a bush on fire. I'm sure he had seen uh, bushes on fire before, but not like this because it was not consumed. And even more dramatically, God spoke to Moses from the bush and calls Moses to lead his people to go to Pharaoh and to say, Pharaoh, let my people go. And he is going to lead them out of Egyptian slavery. 
He reveals himself as the Lord, as Yahweh, I am who I am. And Moses, great man although he was, wasn't up to this. Uh, he raised all kinds of objections, all kinds of arguments and reservations not to be the person who would go to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, and say, let my people go. But eventually he obeys, and with his brother Aaron, who's three years older, they appeared before Pharaoh. And we thought of that confrontation, the first two confrontations, we thought of that last week. From Moses' perspective, these initial confrontations with Pharaoh do not go well. Pharaoh sees himself as a god, as a god of Egypt, and he is much more powerful, he thinks, uh, than the god of Israel, than the god of slaves. And rather than letting the people go in this initial confrontations, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. His view is uh, that the slaves have too much time on their hands. If they were really working hard, they wouldn't have time to think about going into the wilderness uh, to sacrifice and to serve God. And so when he hears Moses and Aaron saying, let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness, quoting the words of the Lord, he tells the taskmasters that these slaves must get their own straw. Up till then, the straw for the bricks was provided. And even though they've got to work additionally to get the straw, the number of bricks they produce each day remains the same. And so from Moses' perspective, he has been a failure. And the people of Israel are very angry, angry at Moses for making their situation even worse. But the Lord reminds Moses, as we saw in that wonderful chapter, chapter 6, He reminds Moses of His covenantal promises. We thought this morning of the promises of God, that we can depend upon God. And isn't it in the case that in the tough times of life, in the difficult times, it's wonderful to reassure ourselves and reaffirm our faith by claiming the promises of God. And so Moses and Aaron are recommissioned, as it were, by God. And in spite of the miracles uh, performed before Pharaoh, his heart is still hardened. He doesn't listen to Moses and Aaron, and there's a clear conflict between the God of Israel, the true God, Yahweh, and the false gods of Egypt. Now, we're going to look this evening from verse 14 of chapter 7, which we've read, through to the end of, end of chapter 10. I've called this message the ten plagues, but really we're only going to consider the first nine plagues. The last plague is the great plague, the most important of the plagues, when the firstborn of Israel is going to die, and when the Passover is going to be instituted. So we're going to think of the Passover next week, and we're going to conclude the service by communion, so do come. Now, Moses and Aaron had performed miracles before Pharaoh and his magicians. In Scripture, there are four episodes of miracles. We tend to think in the Bible there's miracles all the time. That's not really the case. There are four great episodes of miracles in the Bible. The first is at the time of Moses that we're reading. The second was at the time of Elijah. You'll remember if you know your Bibles. The third, of course, was at the time of our Lord in His incarnation when He comes and the kingdom of God is invading the kingdom of darkness. And there's tremendous miracles being done by the Lord and His apostles. The fourth great episode of miracles is going to come yet future during the tribulation. We thought of that some time ago when we worked our way through the book of Revelation. This evening we're going to see very vividly the forces of darkness opposing the forces of God. Is Satan greater and stronger than God? Is darkness greater than light? We've, we are going to uh, be encouraged this evening as we think of the greatness of God invading and defeating the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of Satan. Now, let me very quickly go over the nine plagues. The nine plagues, number one, which we read from Exodus 7, water in the Nile turning to blood. The next one was frogs, gnats, flies, the livestock dying boils, hail, locusts, 
And the ninth plague is darkness. Old Testament scholars have said, and I think they're right, that these nine plagues are directed against specific gods of Egypt. So the plagues, as it were, are not selected by God at random, but are polemics against the Egyptian false gods. And as the plagues, one after another, descend on Egypt, we can hear the cries of the Egyptians calling out to their false gods to help them. But it becomes increasingly clear as the plagues follow each other that the God of Israel is greater than the gods of Egypt. Now, we can divide the nine plagues into three groups, three triads. Here's the first one that we read of from Exodus 7, the Nile turning to blood, then frogs, and then gnats. That's the first triad. The second triad, flies, livestock dying, and boils. The third triad is hail, locusts, and darkness. Now, the first plague in each triad, blood, flies, and hail, are preceded by the Lord instructing Moses to go to Pharaoh in the morning. Look, for example, at Exodus 7, verse 15. This is the first plague of the first triad, the water of the Nile turning to blood. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he's going out to the water. Stand on the bank of the Nile to meet him and take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. Chapter 8, verse 20. Here is the first plague of the second triad. The fourth plague flies. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve you. And then chapter 9, verse 13, the first plague of the third triad, the hail. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve you. The first three plagues, first triad, come by the use of Aaron's staff. Chapter 7, verse 19, and the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff and stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt. Chapter 8, verse 20. Sorry, chapter 8, verse 5, rather. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the rivers, over the canals, and over the pools, and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Chapter 8, verse 16. Here's the third plague. The Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. So for the first three plagues, they come into place, as it were, with Aaron's staff. The first two plagues in the second triad, the flies and the livestock, we won't read the references, but they come through the Lord directly. The sixth plague, the boils, comes through Moses doing a rather strange thing what, by throwing soot in the air. The last triad, hail, locusts, and darkness, come through Moses stretching out his hand and staff. The second plague in each triad, frogs, livestock dying, and locusts, are all introduced by warning to Pharaoh. If you read all of the nine, the first nine of the plagues, not all of them are preceded by a warning to Pharaoh. But the second plague in each triad, frogs, livestock dying, and locusts, are all introduced by warning. The warning in the, these three cases are given by Moses and Aaron when they go to Pharaoh in his palace and give him the warning prior to the plagues coming. The third plague in each triad, the gnats, the boils, and the darkness, are all mentioned without any warning given to Pharaoh at all. But think of this. Think of the impact on Pharaoh, on the Egyptians, of one plague after another, leading up to the tenth plague that we'll think of next week, the death of the firstborn. Look at chapter 9, verse 24. 
That's the seventh plague, which was hail. You think you get really bad hail sometimes here in North Carolina, but listen to this. Chapter 9, verse 24. There was hail, this is the seventh plague, and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as had never been in all of the land of Egypt since it became a nation. The eighth plague was locusts. Look at chapter 10, verse 14. Here's the eighth plague, locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Must have been millions of them. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been, nor will ever be again. So the plagues are increasing in severity. And of course, the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn, is the climax. Kaiser, in his commentary, believes that the triads come in increasing, in ascending order of severity. He says the first three plagues introduced irritations, the second triad, destructions, and the final plagues, the seventh, eighth, and ninth, produced death. And the plague of darkness demonstrates that Pharaoh was not the sun god. He believed he was the sun god, but here is the power of God plunging Egypt into darkness. Now you say, what was the purpose of the plagues? Well, I'll mention three reasons. First of all, to deliver Israel. Chapter 3, verse 10, God's call was to be sent by God to Pharaoh, quote, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And when Moses and Aaron appeared before Pharaoh over and over again, what did they say? Chapter, look at chapter 5, for example, going back. Chapter 5, verse 1. Here's the first confrontation. Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Chapter 7, verse 16. And you shall say to him, this is before the first plague, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, sent me to you, saying, Let my people go, that they may serve you in the wilderness. Chapter 8, verse 1 before the plague of the frogs, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve you. Chapter 8, verse 20, before the fourth plague, the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself to Pharaoh as he goes out to the water and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve you. Chapter 9, verse 1, before the fifth plague, then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. Chapter 9, verse 13, before the seventh plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. Chapter 10, verse 3 before the eighth plague of locusts. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Do you think Pharaoh was getting the message? Over and over again, the message is, Go to Pharaoh and tell him, not that this is your message, that the Lord God, the true God, is saying to you, the God of Israel, let my people go. And over and over again, Pharaoh hardens his heart. And over and over again, the Lord hardens Pharaoh's heart. He's faced with the Word of God, and he disobeys the voice of the true Lord God. Now, Moses shouldn't have been surprised by this because he'd been told in chapter 3, verse 19, that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. That mighty hand was not the hand of Moses. It wasn't the hand of Aaron, but it was the hand of the Lord. Moses had been told in chapter 4, verse 21, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, and I will harden his heart 
so that he will not let the people go. So as Moses is given this great privilege, but also tremendous responsibility, the Lord clearly communicates to Moses that the Lord was going to deliver the people from Egyptian slavery, but there's going to be opposition, and Pharaoh repeatedly is going to resist letting the people go. But their deliverance was going to come from the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 1, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will send them out, and with a strong hand he will deliver them out of his land. So the plagues are designed to compel Pharaoh to let the people go. Without the supernatural intervention by the Lord in these plagues, Pharaoh's hard heart, his hard heart, which was becoming increasingly hard, would have continued, and he would never have let the children of Israel go. The final plague, the death of the Egyptian firstborn, was, quote, yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. That's chapter 11, verse 1 that we'll look at next week. Isn't it marvelous to know, in spite of the opposition from the superpower, from this mighty man, Pharaoh, with so much at his disposal in Egypt, that God always accomplishes His purposes. We need to remind ourselves about that. We, we sometimes panic, don't we, about what's happening in the world? You know, what's going to happen with Iran? Uh, what's going to happen in our own country? And, and sometimes it shakes us. It really shouldn't shake us. We know that God is in control and that God's purposes, however fierce the opposition and however strong the evil, God is stronger. And His purposes will be accomplished. And furthermore, His judgment will come on those who resist Him. Do you believe that? Do you believe in God's judgment? No, we're told that God is a God of love. He is a God of love. But it's said in such a way that God is weak. He's, he's a bit of a wimp, isn't He? No, God is strong. This is a mighty hand. Think of the plagues over people who repeatedly resisted the voice of God. Those who resist the voice of God, those who take for granted the patience of God, have to understand that God's judgment finally comes. And it comes in a very dramatic way with the death of the firstborn in the tenth plague. During the tribulation period, if you've studied the book of Revelation, you will know that in future, after the church is raptured to be forever with the Lord, and before the messianic reign of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is this period on earth called the tribulation, the great tribulation, and it is a time, it's a frightful time, when the judgment of God falls on this earth. And it falls on God's earth with the unfolding of the seals and the, and the bowls and so on, described graphically in Revelation, from Revelation 6 through Revelation 18, with increasing severity, with increasing intensity. And we see a precursor of that, as it were, with these plagues falling on ancient Egypt. So why the plagues? First of all, to deliver Israel. Secondly, to demonstrate victory over the Egyptian gods to demonstrate that our God, the true God, is greater than Pharaoh, is greater than all of their gods. There was a multiplicity of gods in Egypt. Pharaoh himself regarded himself as a god, and the miracles initially performed by the Lord through Moses and Aaron with the staff, remember they were duplicated with the sorcerers and the magicians. Chapter 7, verse one, uh, sorry, chapter 7, verse 11. We saw this last week. This is before the first plague, when they go before uh, Pharaoh. Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, notice this, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. 
So, okay, Moses, Aaron, you, you do these tricks with the staff. You got the snake, you got the leprosy. You know, it's pretty cool. But my magicians, they can do the same. Isn't that what we read? They did the same by their secret arts. So Pharaoh believes. He believes in the supernatural. He believes in other forces. He believes in gods. He is a god. And he believes that the supernatural power of Egypt is as good, is as strong, if not stronger, uh, than the power of the Lord. Did you notice in the first plague, when the Nile was turned into blood, chapter 7, verse 22, but the magicians of Egypt did the same by their secret arts. They also turned the water of the Nile into blood. Similarly, with the second plague of the frogs, chapter 8, verse 7. All of these frogs are all over Egypt. Verse 6, Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. But the magicians did the same by their secret arts and made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. We can do it as well. Now, you could ask, why did the magicians reverse the plagues and show their superiority over God, but they were unable to do that? And notice in the third plague of the gnats, chapter 8, verse 18. First plague, water turning into blood. Second plague, frogs. Third plague, plague gnats. Chapter 8, uh, the end of verse 17, all the dust of the earth became gnats in all the land of Egypt. The magicians tried by their secret arts to produce gnats, but they could not. So there were gnats on man and beast. Then the magician said to Pharaoh, isn't this interesting? This is the finger of God. Yeah, Satan and his demons have power. They can do miracles. They can mimic uh, a miracle, but only God is all-powerful. Satan is powerful, but there is a limit to his power. And after the first two plagues, the turning of the water into blood and the frogs, the magicians cannot duplicate the plagues. In fact, with the sixth plague, the boils, chapter 9, verse 11, this is a little amusing, isn't it, with the boils? Chapter 9, 11, and the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boils came upon the magicians <laughs> and upon all the Egyptians. Not only couldn't they duplicate it, they, they couldn't stop the plague actually coming on them. And that's the last we hear of the magicians in Egypt. Opposition to God. Uh, John, in uh, 1 John 4, talks about the spirits of the Antichrist. Now, the Antichrist hasn't come. He's going to rise to power um, during a tribulation period. Uh, but down through the history of mankind, there's been what is called the spirit of the Antichrist. There's always opposition to God. When God is at work, Satan is also at work. He tries to disrupt it, he tries to stop it. He tries to mimic it. He tries to deceive people. And that, of course, is going to come to a head during the tribulation period with the appearance of this very powerful man, the man of sin, the Antichrist, who has got incredible power. But John reminds us, as he talks about the spirits of the Antichrist in 1 John 4, verse 4, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That's good to remember, isn't it? as we live our Christian life. You ever aware of opposition? You ever aware of the forces of darkness against you? Do you ever feel that Satan is harassing you? I've said before, one of my friends, a fellow pastor, when he calls me, he, he, he always says, how, how is uh, Satan harassing you today? What's Satan up to, up to in your church? Satan is busy, isn't he? He deceives. He throws his fiery darts, Paul says in Ephesians 6. 
But we remind ourselves, and we see this in the plagues, that greater is He who is in us than he who is in the world. And the gods of Egypt, with their magicians, with their sorcerers, with their black magic, as it were, couldn't undo the miracles performed by the Lord. These plagues were attacks on Egypt and its power. Pharaoh had cast the baby boys into the Nile, uh, but now the Nile, as it's turned into blood, is in effect attacking Egypt. Still, Pharaoh hardened his heart. But the false gods of Egypt are being defeated, and the Egyptians are seeing this right in front of their eyes, with one plague coming after another with increasing severity. So, brother, sister, don't be afraid of the devil. What does James say? Resist the devil, and he does what? He f Do you believe that? Do you believe that if you resist the devil, he'll flee from you? That's an amazing thing. With all of his power, with all of his deception, yes. A little boy who knows Christ can resist the devil. A young believer can resist the devil. We as a church of Jesus Christ here at Calvary Church have to stand against the forces of darkness. We are to resist him. We're to put on the full armor of God and stand strong against the power of evil in darknesses. So don't be afraid of him. Paul reminds us at the end of Colossians chapter 1 about the power of God. He says, God powerfully works within us. We thought this morning that in our weakness, in our frailty, in our confusion, that God's grace is evident. It's sufficient. And in our weakness, there's a demonstration of the power of God. God powerfully works within us. Purpose of the plagues then, number one, to deliver Israel. Number two, to demonstrate uh, that God is greater than the Egyptian gods. We were singing about the greatness of God. And third, to demonstrate the uniqueness of the Lord. There is none like Him. We've seen that with the series with wings like eagles. I think Isaiah must have known about Exodus. He must have studied the book of Exodus because there are so many parallels, aren't there? There are many, many false gods, but there's only one true God. There's none like Yahweh, the Lord. I am who I am. Remember when Moses and Aaron first go to Pharaoh, he asks in chapter 5, verse 2, who is the Lord that I should obey His voice and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and moreover, I will not let Israel go. What arrogance. No, Pharaoh, you don't know the Lord. If you did know the Lord, you wouldn't be talking like that. You would be flat on your face. You would be humbling yourself before the true God. And you think you're greater than the true God? And Moses and Aaron over and over again explain that the Lord, Yahweh, is the God of Israel. He's the God of the Hebrews, and He's on their side. And when Moses himself hesitates, what does God do? We saw this in chapter 6. God reminds him, I am the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 6, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. That's what we do, don't we? When we hesitate, when we have times of doubt, when we wonder why God hasn't answered our prayer, well, when we're weak, when we're exhausted, when we wonder if we can just go through another day, and when this situation will end itself, what are we to do? We're to remind ourselves who God is. I am who I am. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I'm the true God and I'm with you. And Moses is repeatedly reminded of that phrase, I am the Lord. And this evening, I remind you, brother, sister, that God is the true God, the unique God. He is the Lord, the ever one who's from everlasting to everlasting, the Alpha 
and the Omega, the all-powerful, eternal God of love, and He is our heavenly Father. So in our weakness, when we don't know what to do, we remind ourselves that we belong to this Lord. And in the appearances of Aaron and Moses before Pharaoh, the goal of the confrontation, in fact, the goal of all of the plagues is, chapter 7, verse 5, that the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. In the first plague, did you notice verse 17? Chapter 7, verse 17, you're still exalting yourself against my people and will not let them go. I am the Lord. For this purpose, verse 16, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all of the earth. The end of verse 14, so that you may know, Pharaoh, that there is none like me in all of the earth. Look at chapter 8, verse 10. With the second plague of the frogs, and he said, tomorrow, Moses said, be it as you say so, that you may know that there is no one like the Lord your God. Chapter 8, verse 22, with the plague of the flies. But on that day I will set apart the land of Goshen, where my people dwell, so that no swarms of flies shall be there, that you may know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. In the seventh plague, chapter 9, verse 29. Isn't this fascinating? Moses said to him, chapter 9, verse um, 29. Sorry, I'm in the wrong chapter. Um, yes, chapter 9, verse 29. Moses said to him, as soon as I've gone out of the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the Lord is the earth. The eighth plague, chapter 10, verse 2, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I've dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I've done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Do you get that? Over and over and over again to Moses and to Pharaoh. You have to realize that there is the true God and that I am the Lord. Thousands of false gods, but I am the true God. And after the triumph of the people through the Red Sea, in that magnificent song of praise in Exodus 15 that we'll look at, Lord willing, sometime, the Israelites sing, chapter 15, verse 11, "'Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods?' Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? Rhetorical questions. Of course there is no one like the Lord. He is unique. He's God. He's all-powerful. He's preeminent. He's, he's glorious. There is no one like our God, and there will never, ever be anyone like Him because He is the true God. And you say, well, what's the point? The point is this, as Paul says so eloquently in, in Romans 8, if God is for us, who can be against us? What's our problem? I began the series with Wings Like Eagles saying that we often have a very small view of God, that our God is too small, a God is, that's remarkably like our culture, a God who remarkably thinks like we do. We've, we've got a, often a false God, a God that we have created rather than understanding the true God. Pharaoh, the Egyptians, didn't understand who the true God is. And now with these terrible, terrible plagues and judgments on Egypt, they're going to understand that there is no God like this God, and this God is all-powerful. Well, what do we say to all of this? I say to you first, take a lesson from Pharaoh. He hardened his heart. Remember the book of Hebrews? Repeatedly, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden his heart. Have you heard God speaking to you today, this week as you've read his word? 
Do you know anything about conviction? Do you know anything about God challenging you? Satan always says, I deal with it tomorrow. Scripture says, no, today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get right with God. Today is the day to repent. Today is the day to surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Today, if you hear His voice, brother, sister, do not harden your heart. When faced with the truth of God, we either humbly receive it and obey it, or we resist it. And the more we resist it, and the more we oppose it, and the more we refuse to deal with the sin in our life or obey God, the harder and harder our hearts will become. God's Word changes us. Either your heart will be softened or hardened. My dad used to tell us as little boys about them. I'm sure it wasn't original with my dad, but here is the sun shining down. Here's a pound of butter. The sun melts the butter. Here's a pound of clay. The clay is hardened. The same sun, the same heat, two vastly different effects on the substance. Here is the Word of God coming to us tonight. The Word of God, the voice of God this morning. What's your response? Either you humble yourself, either you obey God, whatever that means in your situation, or if you don't, your heart will become hardened. And people have said to me over the years, well, I know, John, uh, I should do this, but I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it later. I know what I, I think of various people who have said to me, and this is really uh, scary for them to say this, professing believers of Jesus Christ, I know what I'm doing is sinful. I know I should stop doing it, but it's so enjoyable. I'm going to continue to do it, and, and sometime in the future, I'll repent and ask God's forgiveness. You, you ever said anything as foolish as that? I always say to that person, if your heart, your heart is hardened, and if your heart is hardened today, and you refuse to repent, what do you think six months from now or six years from now that somehow you can just decide when you want to repent? Because sin changes us, doesn't it? The Word of God changes us for the good. Sin makes us more and more hardened. And if you're hardened today, and if you continue to hear the voice of God as Pharaoh did, there is an increasing hardness in your heart. We don't want to be hard-hearted, do we? We all know people who over the years have drifted away from the Lord, and they've become harder and harder. They've become more and more bitter. They're more and more entrenched in their position. Why? Because early on, they did not obey the Word of God. We who hear the Word of God, we who read the Word of God, we who are committed to this book as the Word of God, we must be very, very careful that we're not over-familiar with it, that it's not just going into our heads, that it's not just academic knowledge. One of my professors at seminary used to say, the Word of God isn't to, to make you a smarter sinner. It's given to you. Yes, there's information. Our, blind, our minds must be involved but it's given to transform us. There's an act of the will. If I oppose God, if I oppose His Word, if I resist His Word, my heart will get hardened. Don't do that. Don't do that. What does that mean in your life? I don't know. But brother, sister, is, some, is there some sin that you're involved in? Perhaps in your business, some, something unethical, something maybe illegal, some relationship? that is questionable at best and perhaps even sinful, hear the Word of God. We come to Calvary not to hear my voice or anyone else's voice other than the voice of God. And when God speaks to us, He expects instant obedience. Don't harden your heart. If you do harden your heart, God's judgment is coming. God is patient. Think of all of the opportunities. Pharaoh had over and over and over again, he's given the Word of God, and he continues to resist until God's judgment comes. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. These plagues are precursors of the judgment of God on the earth during the tribulation period. Some of them are very similar 
blood and hail and darkness and locusts and so on. Yes, God will judge His people. God will judge those who resist Him, who do not obey the gospel. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 8 that our Lord will come in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews say it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. No, we want soft hearts, don't we? We want to live in the fear of the Lord. We want to follow our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate. There's none like Him, nor will there ever be anyone like Him. He's unique in His birth, unique in His life, unique in His death, unique in His resurrection, unique in His high priestly ministry, unique in His return. Love Him, obey Him, serve Him, praise Him with all of your heart. And remember this, when you realize that the forces of darkness are against you, and that temptation comes, and that opposition comes, and it's wearisome, isn't it, sometimes? Remember this, if God is for us, who can be against? Is God for us? Is God for you? Of course He is. God was against Pharaoh. God is for us, and if God is for us, who can be against us? Father, we think of these plagues. Yeah, we know You're a patient God, but You're also a holy God and a just God. And we know if we disobey the gospel, if our hearts are hardened, Your judgment will come. We thank You for Your grace. We thank You that You give us hearts which are soft as we respond to Your Word as we do this now. We've heard Your Word this morning from this pulpit, from life groups, from our own reading, and again this evening. We bow in Your presence. Help us to make the changes that are necessary. Bring comfort, Father, to those who are going through difficult times. Bring conviction to those who are dabbling in sin. And for those here, perhaps, who don't know Christ, open their eyes. Help them to see the ugliness of their sin. Help them to flee, flee from the wrath to come and to flee to Christ, who comes as the Savior of the world. Thank You for Your salvation. Thank You for the forgiveness of sins. And help us to live for Your glory this week. In Christ's name, amen.